It's time for security now. Steve Gibson is here. We've got questions. We've got answers. And he's going to talk about the latest news, including, yes, the Dell certificate fiasco. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Security Now is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson, episode 535, recorded Tuesday, November 24th, 2015. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 223. Security Now is brought to you by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code SECURITYNOW when you check out. And by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping in time for the holidays when you go to ring.com slash security now. It's time for Security Now, the show where we talk about your security and safety online. And thank goodness, I thank goodness every day that Steve Gibson's out there helping us understand this and do the best we can. Steve Gibson, our host for the last 10 years of Security Now. Hi, Steve. Well, <laughs> the first and last 10 years of Security Now. And we'll continue so <laughs> as long as as long as long God, what is it? The good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise. And there seems to be no slowdown in things oh, for us man, to talk no. about. Yeah. Uh, so we have a, a Q&A this week. Uh, this is episode four, I'm uh, sorry, 534. I was looking at the last digit, 534, Q&A number 223. Lots to talk about. In addition to uh, great questions from our listeners, uh, we, of course, will cover the story about Dell stepping in it big time. Oh, boy. And then answer the question, has LastPass stepped in something too? Uh-oh. Uh, uh, we'll cover Windows 10's various recent struggles briefly. Uh, there is an interesting document, 43 pages, uh, that I'm just going to summarize briefly from the Manhattan DA uh, about their position on smartphone encryption oh, um, I can that I want to cover. Uh, we got a bunch of updates and miscellaneous fun stuff, uh, an important piece of errata from something I got wrong a couple weeks ago, and then uh, a great Q&A. So lots of good stuff. A jam-packed show for you. Can't wait. I got the questions, Steve's got the answers, and a lovely cup of joe, it looks like. <laughs> that looks good, whatever you just sipped from. Uh, Steve, you know oh. how much Steve loves these guys. It's Harry's time. And, yes, uh, there's nothing here. Yeah, the smoothest, bestest shave you ever got for a price that uh, just leaves the other guys shivering. <laughs> How can they do that? Harry's is a great shave at a fraction of price. All you have to do is go to harrys.com and take a look. Browse around. Harry's solves the problem that many of us have overpaying, not for the razors, but for the blades. That's where they get you, isn't it? Actually, they get you both ways now. They've actually stopped the pretense of undercharging for the razor. They overcharge for the razor and the blade, not Harry's. No, no. Harry's is very affordable, beautiful razors, and then the best blades ever. You don't have to worry about that very expensive drugstore blade, the one that's locked up because it's so expensive. Harry's gives us beautiful, high-quality razors, about half the price of those big brand blades. They make them at their factory in Germany. That's how they can save. They engineer them for sharpness and high performance and sell them directly to you with free shipping Harry's is more efficient. That means you get better pricing. Each kit, of course, includes a razor with a handle that looks and feels great. Three razor blades. The foaming shave gel, although I'm a big fan of the cream. You get your choice. And the just the nicest shave for the... And it kind of makes the shave feel better when you know you're not paying that ridiculous price. Take a look at the uh, Truman set. Uh, just $15. Actually, I'll tell you how you can pay even less. That's the one uh, Steve uses with the nice... He likes the plastic handle. I like the Winston set with the metal handle. You know, but to each his own. You get the, 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 the handle, the three blades, the travel cover, and the fantastic full-size shave gel or shave cream. 
Not, it's not like some sample size. It's a full-size one. All that for $15. And when you use the offer code security now, $5 off, so it's only $10. I just got something new. I did, too. There, there's like a a, a face-cleaning cleanser yeah. thing. Yeah, did they and send there's you also some stuff? And, there, there, and there, there's also an aftershave. Yeah, the balm is keep, great. I've, so this I is have a daily such a routine. Face wash. Yeah. And then um, I'll show you. Uh, this is the kit. Here's the after, the little sample of the aftershave moisturizer in there. I think it's just great. Really love it. Harry's, H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. A great shave at a fraction of the price. And $5 off your first order with the coupon security now. There's the blades. I get these uh, shipped to me. I don't ever have to worry about running out of blades or cream. And, you know, that's nice because then you don't mind changing the blades, as you should, on a regular basis to guarantee a nice clean yep. shave. Okay, Harry's. Pull too much. Yeah, no more pull. Because you got pull with Harry's. Uh, let's get into the uh, security So news. our picture of the week is yes. our top story, or at least our first story. Uh, and this is a picture that, that someone was nice enough to tweet from their own Dell machine, ah. uh, which shows a, uh, a certificate that was issued by E. Delroot, issued to E. Delroot, uh, in other words, it's self-signed. Um, it, it, in, interestingly enough, <clears throat> excuse me, it's valid from 4-7-2015. So this is, it's been around for a while. Uh, they weren't, uh, they weren't using any of the, of the benefit of expiration. So their own certificate, which they created, expires at the, on New Year's Eve <laughs> of 2039. Oh boy. So they intended that thing to sit around in the Dell machines forever. And the other interesting uh, thing to note there is that certificates always have um, restrictions on, 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 like, on what they're permitted to be used for. And this certificate has no restrictions. For example, GRC's certificates say it can be used for authenticating the identity of a web server or authenticating the identity of a web client, this is all issuance policies and all application policies. So it could also be used for code signing. So anyway, so here's, so here's what happened. Uh, essentially, uh, this has caused a, a huge concern in the industry because this is another instance and, and we've, we've covered this from so many different directions in the past. Another instance of, a, of some third party putting their own certificate authority certificate in the root store of the machine. And in this case, the, the private key is also available which and, and that's the that's the piece that is normally that is protected with with all the, the the power a certificate authority has because what they're doing is they're they're um, they're uh, the well we, I guess I guess we we've covered the whole certificate PKI infrastructure uh, over and over ad infinitum because it's something that we depend upon to such a degree. Um, but for, so what this is being compared to is Superfish that, of course, we covered uh, in the past. Then we've also seen various anti-malware packages installing their own certificates. All of these are bad. Um, however, there is a degree of badness to them. For example, if each anti-malware package generates a certificate and then plants it in the root store for the machine, then at least all the certificates are different. In this case, all of the Dell machines that have this have the identical certificate, which means they have the identical public key and private key, and that makes it trivial to, to break into their communications and to to essentially intercept what they're doing, raising no alarms or, or, or warnings of any kind. So, for example, Ars Technica's coverage uh, 
Dan, Dan Gooden says, Dell does a superfish, ships PCs with easily clonable root certificates. In a move eerily similar to the superfish debacle that visited Lenovo in February, Dell is shipping computers. Oh, and by the way, notice this is two months later, two months after the superfish debacle. Dell said, oh, let's do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, well. <laughs> I, I do wonder how this happened, but they they probably whatever whoever decided to do this said, oh, but but we're not going to use it for advertising as Lenovo did. We're just using it for support so we can get your Dell ID tag. That's, well, that's yes, harmless, exactly. right? Uh, right. So so uh, uh, R says Dell is shipping computers that come pre-installed with a digital certificate that makes it easy for attackers to cryptographically impersonate Google. Bank of America, or any other HTTPS-protected website, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to skip down to Robert Graham of Errata Security, um, uh, who is, you know, a well-known expert in the industry. He says in his blog post, it was discovered this weekend that new Dell computers, as well as old ones with updates, come with a CA uh, e-Dell root that includes the private key. This means hackers can trivially eavesdrop on the SSL communications of Dell computers. If I were a Blat Hat hacker, I'd immediately go to the nearest big city airport and sit outside the international first class lounges and eavesdrop on everyone's encrypted communications. I suggest international first class because if they can afford $10,000 for a ticket, they probably have something juicy on their computer worth hacking. I point this out in order to describe the severity of Dell's mistake. It's not a simple bug that needs to be fixed. It's a drop everything and panic sort of bug. <laughs> Dell needs to panic. Dell's corporate customers need to panic. Note that Dell's spinning of this issue has started, saying that they aren't like Lenovo because they didn't install bloatware like Superfish. This yeah. doesn't matter. The problem with Superfish wasn't the software, but the private key. In this respect, Dell's error is exactly as bad as the Superfish error. So, uh, several things have happened. Uh, um, among them, there is there there are two exploitability test sites. The links for which I have in the show notes. One is uh, HTTPS colon. You have to remember that you're trying to test a certificate, so you want to make a secure connection. HTTPS colon slash slash bogus dot lessons learned dot org. A great URL, by the way. <laughs> yes. And now, so this is a I'm doing it on my Dell, uh, which I already know, because this, this was came out in January, and these... These Dells were only infected uh, starting in August. Although you said there was an update. I never got an update that added that root certificate. But this is what you want to see, right? Correct. There's a and problem the thing, with this website certificate. Right. Uh, and then the other one is edell, E-D-E-L-L -L dot T-L-S fun dot D-E. And that's a little more user friendly. That's the one. That's the link that our listeners are going to want to send to their friends who they know have Dell laptops, because it it gives you a yay or nay and some explanation and background and and other links and things. E D E L L dot T L S F U N dot D E. So those are two sites which have popped up to to, to uh, essentially. They have synthesized their own bogus certificates, which no, no, no one's normal correct root store would honor. And by the way, Firefox won't honor it. In fact, when I tried to go there, that site said, well, you're using Firefox. So you were never in any trouble, even if you're using a Dell laptop. And that, in fact, that's one of the short-term mitigations, although we already have Dell's permanent one, I'll get to in a second, is simply use Firefox. As we know, Firefox brings along its own root store because it it has its own security uh, library system as part of it. Is this Whereas, not the case for Chrome? 
No. no. Uh, it's really interesting that it's the certificate security portion of Windows that for some reason Chrome shares. And you can see that because if you like, if you inspect the certificate in Chrome, you get Windows dialogues that are identical to what IE or um, Edge will show you because Chrome is actually using the Windows API. So it's, it didn't do its own, it's sharing Windows. So, so, Chrome, so the risk is IE, um, Chrome, and Edge on a Dell laptop or actually any laptop with that certificate, but presumably only Dell. Yeah, I don't think anybody else is going to put an E-Dell root certificate on there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the problem now is, you know, bad guys could, or, or you know, people wanting to play around could, could stick that on your machine. To make that clear, because they all use the same private key, and that private key is revealed, stupidly, in, in the certificate, anybody could do a man in the middle and say, with us, with this fake certificate saying I'm Bank of America baby well correct and so so for example a a l arguably legitimate although uh, worrisome use is a corporate firewall that insists on scanning into secure connections many you know a growing number of corporations are doing this because HTTPS is becoming more prevalent so there will be on the perimeter of the corporate network, there will be a, an, an intercepting proxy which will, will, it will, it will disallow any secure connection um, that it can't see into. And so part of what the corporation has to do, every computer inside that network will have a certificate from that appliance and so it's it's the certificate from that appliance which has been added to the normal collection of certificates that gives that appliance the unique ability to intercept and in inspect all the traffic uh, leaving and and coming into the corporate perimeter and so the point is that because all of these Dell laptops were including this certificate, with the private key, it would be possible for anyone to act just like that kind of deep packet inspecting filter anywhere on the internet and and intercept any Dell communications, decrypt it, look at it, and then re-encrypt it, and it would provide no warning to the user. Now, the coolest utility is one that we've talked about before. And that's, uh, I've got the link also in the show notes. It's uh, Windows Apps by FS1. And the app is a tiny little 40K executable for Windows. It's at tracks, T-R-A-X dot X10, that is X10 dot MX slash apps dot HTML. Uh, we've referred to it before. It went away for a while and came back. Um, what this does, this RCC tool inspects your certificate store for anything that shouldn't be there and provides you with a little audit. So very handy. Anyone running it on a Dell machine, this thing would immediately, even before this was known publicly, would have raised a flag and said, wait a minute. Uh, there's what's his e Dell certificate sitting around doing, but anyway, Dell has, and again, a link in the show notes here. Their official remover is has now been issued. Um, it's uh, and I've got the link here. It's too long for me to to stick into the podcast audio, but it's e Dell root cert fix dot exe. What Dell said yesterday in a you know a CYA uh, style response is. They, they, they wrote, today we became aware that a certificate, e Dell root, installed by our Dell Foundation Services application on our PCs, unintentionally introduced a security vulnerability. The certificate was implemented as part of a support tool and intended to make it faster and easier 
for our customers to service their system. It makes it easier for anyone to service your system. Customer security and privacy is our top concern and priority for Dell. We deeply regret, I'm sure, that this has happened and are taking steps to address it. The certificate is not malware or adware. Okay, big comfort. Rather, it was intended to provide the system service tag to Dell Online Support, allowing us to quickly identify the computer model, making it easier and faster to service our computers. This certificate is not being used to collect personal customer information. It's also important to note that the certificate will not reinstall itself once it is properly removed using the recommended Dell process. However, note, if you, if you simply remove it from the certificate store, the, the, the Dell service will see that it's gone and reinstall it. Oh. So you have to. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, so it, Dell. It comes back. Now, uh, no, they, don't... they could have done this without doing well, I don't even understand why you do a self signed certificate if all you want to do is identify the machine's tag. See, that's just it. I, I haven't had a chance because I'm just to this, don't you think? pulling all this together. But this really, this, this seems odd to me. I, you know, it's, you know, the only, well, <laughs> the only thing I could imagine is that is that they've got a server somewhere or some automated appliance. So it's almost like you're logging into a, a VPN kind of situation. You, well, or 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 there's something autonomous that they've set up, which which where they want to have a secure connection, and rather than simply buying a certificate for it from any of the existing certificate authorities, in which case all of the Dell computers could connect to that with no trouble. They got fancy and they said, well, we don't want to, uh, we don't need to buy one of those nasty certificates from someone else because then we'll have to renew it every couple of years. We'll have to pay them money, blah, blah, blah. So we're just going to install our own root CA in all of our machines so that we're so that those machines are able to talk to our own private certificate that we don't have to buy and and won't expire ever <laughs> essentially till 2039 and as always the, only... the worst thing in in technology the worst thing in IT is somebody who's half smart smart <laughs> right smart enough to install a self signed certificate but not smart enough right. to understand the implications of what they just did right and 60 days after the Superfish debacle that did the same thing. Because this thing was signed in April of, of this year, and Superfish was in February. So I was like, okay. And, and I, I think probably the good news is this has a, been a huge kerfuffle. At least, I mean, Dell is a substantial company with a huge, you know, corporate customer base. And corporations must be going crazy All to know... Of our Finance computers are Dells. All of our editor's machines are Dells. My laptop yeah. is a Dell. They make nice hardware. I've been and recommending <laughs> Dells. And it's feature complete, Leo. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> right down to the self-signed certificate. So, so the good news is Lenovo, you know, that happened. Now it's happened with Dell. Hopefully... This like peop other people are listening. Somehow Dell didn't get the message. I don't know how many more times we're going to have to go through this, but of course, you know, this is the, this is a lesson that we're going to have to learn. Obviously, more than once. Uh, anyway, this uh, in the show notes, this RCC XE for Windows machines, which of course are Dell machines, uh, is a neat little quick auditing tool that spots anything. In fact, many people have, have tweeted that they found that their anti-malware had installed its own cert in their machine. And again, if if it's it can technically be done in a in a safer way. If the if the anti-malware is in your machine and the cert's in your machine, then it's it's sort of a there's it's only locally that there's any decryption. I still don't like it, but 
you know, if you want your secure traffic to be deeply inspected, then this is the way that happens. Even Microsoft's Fiddler tool sticks a cert in, in the store because it wants to be able to audit your secure uh, communication. So if it's local and if it's and if the certificate is if they're all different so that it's degenerated fresh, um, then it's it, it's it's more acceptable. What isn't is that anybody who gets a copy of this cert can now intercept all can, can essentially uh, 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 get into the communications of Dell machines. So don't yikes. take this the wrong way, but you tr you trust this Sven guy, right? Yeah. Okay, because he's he's Cuban. The site's hosted in Mexico. It's closed source software. I mean, really? You trust this guy? He's okay. FS1. He's like, he's cool. I think so. <laughs> okay. Just saying. Uh, all right. <laughs> uh, what else? <laughs> Boy, Leah, we've really made you paranoid. Ten years. I have of this become podcast. paranoid. I don't, you know, when I see .mx and then I see he's, he's Cuban, I, I just, you know, I'm sure he's a nice guy. His name is Sven from Cuba. And I and I do think I'm probably too trusting. I I'm I'm too focused on the technology and I think, oh, isn't that cool? Look at it's 40k XE and it audits my root store. Well, you're what right. What could possibly I, I be wrong with that? You can, by the way, and I should probably say, it'd be better off to either use a Microsoft console <laughs> management tool to remove this by hand. Of course, then Dell's gonna reinstall it and then maybe yeah. run the Dell app after that. Yeah, the, the thing to do is if you look, if you open the the Windows Services app, you will see Dell Foundation Services. Stop it, and then switch it from automatic to disabled. Ah. That'll that'll shut it down and stop it from re an auto starting. Then you can delete the certificate and it'll stay gone. Um, but if you want to, Dell also now has a "Oops, we're sorry" tool. Uh, and you can simply run that, and it, it does the same thing. Cool. So, next up, last pass. Oh, yeah, now I'm worried about this one. So, uh, two security guys, Marvin Vigo and Alberto Garcia, presented at the recently concluded, uh, I was so tempted to call it Hamsterdam, because, of course, I did love The Wire on HBO. <laughs> that was uh, the uh, Anything's Legal Zone. Right? Yes. Yes, exactly. Hamsterdam. Uh, anyway, the, there was a Black Cat conference where they presented the talk, even the last pass will be stolen, deal with it. And uh, this er, earlier in the week, the, the, the Dell News was recent, so th this was most of my Twitter feed for the last 24 hours. Prior to that, and for days, it's been, oh my God, Steve, can't wait to hear what you think about this and so forth on Security Now. So uh, these guys did a beautiful job of deeply reverse engineering la the, the last pass uh, system, not only the client, but even the server-side API with an, with an eye toward, I mean, really deeply digging into it. And... Um, they did find some things that LastPass could have done better and immediately fixed that we'll talk about. Um, but mostly what they found, and, and the, there's some really good lessons here, are the things that any local attack would have available. For example... And we, we've we've touched on this a number of times, but but you know the the headlines in the popular press got everybody worked up, and and you know and the press guys don't really understand this. They're just seeing you know doing a quick cursory overview of the presentation outline that's been posted so far. So far, we don't have the video up of their actual presentation, but you know and 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 saying, oh my God, you know, LastPass has been hacked. These guys. Make go out of their way. They take pains to say it has not been hacked. But here's the problem: if if I'm using LastPass and I want the convenience of staying logged in 
while I'm using my computer so that when I go to a site, the login fields get populated for me. And if I've told LastPass to even hit the login button, it does that. But at least the login fields get populated. What does that mean? That means that without, without me doing anything, no fingerprint, nothing that I know, nothing that I am, I mean, and not even me, somebody else could walk up to my computer, go to, you know, open a page in, in my browser, go to a site, and bang, they just, you know, last pass, log them in. So the point is, software can do that too. What we've... In, in order to get the convenience of that we want, unfortunately, we've had to empower our computer to be able to log itself in to all of the websites we visit. So if malware gets into our machine or if forensic software, I wouldn't call what these guys did malware, there was nothing malicious about it, they just wanted to pry it apart and to see how it works and see what vulnerabilities they could find. If, if, you, if software is able to inject itself into the browser and the browser has the ability to access your vault for the purpose of getting passwords and usernames, then th that software has access too. So, so, you know, that's essentially what these guys did on like sort of phase one, there were three different aspects to what they did. I mean, they deeply went after this. So the first is, you know, the, the so-called vault decryption attack where, where they were able to, to locally get, you know, with, with full access to the local system, if the user was logged in and I'll note, if you're not logged in, they couldn't do anything. And they acknowledge that. Or if you had multiple accounts, then by default, none of the other ones would be logged in and they couldn't get into those. So it required that the user be logged in in order. And then, you know, the system was able to log you in. So they were able to get access to the vault. It's not surprising, but it should all give us pause. I mean, that's a consequence of the power that we have given to this password manager. And by the way, not just LastPass. This applies to them all, every single one of them that, that operates this way. Then they found something else going further, uh, and that's they called this the disabled one-time password attack. And this is something, again, we talked about years ago. Um, it's, it's, and it's another trade-off, um, which, which LastPass, a.k.a. Joe, uh, you know, carefully made. And that is, what do we do if a user forgets their password? Um, I mean, this is a problem for a practical solution. What do we do? Do we tell them, sorry, you're out of luck. You know, you have no longer have any access to any of the internet. <laughs> no, and, and so they decided that was not practical. So they create a disabled one-time password. You'll remember that LastPass has a one-time password facility and you can create some one-time passwords and for example, print them out or carry them in your wallet if you want to as sort of get, get out of jail free cards. But there is by default and, and you can turn this off. And by the way, you can turn off, keep me logged in. So these various features which were there for convenience or password recovery, um, you know, they, you can disable them. And our listeners now understanding this better may choose to. It's their choice. Less convenience, uh, but more security. So it's the classic trade-off. There is, by default, a disabled one-time password. And by going to recover my password uh, at LastPass, you... You, it, it jumps you through some hoops, communicates with your browser, ends up reaching into the vault and re-enabling the disabled one-time password in order to give you account recovery so that there is an answer to, oh my God, I've lost my password. 
And so once again, these guys tore that protocol apart and figured out a way if they're local and then, and so so this gives them the the this is a get around the the user's not logged in. The user's logged in. It's not that difficult for for anything to get access to the vault because the browser can. If the user's not logged in as I said, there it's just you 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 fall back to a brute force attack which is impractical. They they they, they found some way they felt of maybe reducing it from a 256 bit to 128 bit attack but even that you know 128 bits in today's world is still an extremely strong level of encryption we know we can always add bits and get stronger but you know a lot a lot of uh, internet connections are using 128 bit symmetric uh, key uh, once the the uh, public key is used in order to negotiate that so so this the one time the disabled one time password attack says if you have that feature enabled which it is by default to solve the problem of oh my god i forgot my password then and you're local these guys very cleverly with a lot of work figured out how to get in there and re-enable that in the same way that lastpass re-enables it remotely with the, the 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 whole web interface and conversation uh and then be able to act to open up the user's vault in order to get access to it. So, um, so there. So those are the local side. They also did LastPass side. That is, you know, what about a malicious employee? What about uh, the NSA compelling them to do something? You know, wh you know what possible you know evil LastPass power is there? Well, now that's. That's a tricky thing to answer because we are trusting LastPass. We're running a plugin from LastPass. We're assuming that you know the plugin does what they promise us, and that the plugin encrypts stuff so that they get a blob that they cannot decrypt. You know, we we understand that's always been the key concept, but nothing says it always must be. It turns out, though, they did find something that worried them, which was something called custom JS, custom underscore JS, which was some, some JavaScript which LastPass can inject onto web pages when the LastPass plugin is unable to parse the, the DOM, the document object model, which is the structure of the page, which it needs to do in order to find the username and password fields. So it's sort of a helper JavaScript for specific sites whose, for whatever reason, like specific popular sites where, for whatever reason, the, the generic parser doesn't work. And so these guys realized that that, that was a way that someone evil at the, at the last pass side or or maybe under order from the NSA. I don't know if, you know, the law enough uh, to know whether the NSA could compel LastPass to make a change on, uh, you know, uh, un under certain criteria. LastPass can say, we can't decrypt it. The NSA maybe, I don't know, could say, well, change things for this user so you can. Anyway, th so th these guys did note that, that they felt represented a vulnerability. Um, and then finally, um, there is uh, in Firefox the all of the plugin settings are gathered together in a single file called prefs.js, which is just a blob of plain text, readable. Um, I think it's XML format file which Firefox maintains where all of its preferences and all of its plugins preferences are stored. That's the, the local storage for that kind of stuff. And it includes on Firefox the, the user's encrypted credentials. So the, the concern there has been that they're, they're technically sensitive. You'd like them to stay, they, they are encrypted, and so we're back to the brute force attack on them, but it's better not to have them wandering around. 
The problem is that some users unwittingly post their prefs.js file from Firefox to various internet forums for other people to look at and say, hey, you know, such and such is broken. Can you look at my prefs.js file and tell me what's wrong? And Google will happily, if you put in the a phrase from the from that file or from it's like you know browser plugins dot lastpass dot or something like that you put that into google google turns them up because lots of people over time have posted them and so again it's they're not decrypted you need a brute force attack in order to to get anything back from it but you know it's better not to have those things lost so they they wrapped up their presentation with recommendations for LastPass users saying that uh, th there are two versions of the plugin. There's the compressed, uh, obfuscated JavaScript version, and there's a binary version. They, they felt that the, using the binary version of the plugin was better because it, it was just, it's, you know, it's a binary blob. It's not subject to, to m more uh, uh, ready e editing and manipulation. They said, do not store the master password, which means don't tell LastPass to remember it, and you have to be providing it all the time. And Leo, I know how you love providing your password all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard me complain a few times. Yes. That's when I uh, love the LastPass shows up and says, I'll fill that for you. I feel like yeah, I always love it's, that. It's so convenient. Yeah. But and, and again, as long as your local environment is secure you're fine. And, and notice that, you know, two years ago, uh, right, around, right around this time, when I gave the first unveiling of Squirrel, what I talked about was in this post-Snowden era, who's going to trust a third party? And so the, the Squirrel's power is that there is no such thing as the cloud with Squirrel. There's no LastPass. There's no third party. There's nobody but you in the site you want to log into. The user does have the problem of what if I forget my password? Uh, which is why one of the, uh, one, there, there, there are a couple of mitigations. One is that the client prints out a page for you to put somewhere in cold storage, but more, but more easily than that, when you create an identity, you get something called a rescue code. It's 24 digits, which is, We'll think of it as a one and a half credit card numbers because a credit card number is 16 digits. And I make you write it down just once. Write it down just once and put it away. And, and that is your get out of jail free card. It's offline. It's never stored. But the beauty is nobody else has it and no third party has it. And doesn't matter what the NSA has to say about it. So, so you know, th this is, but it's, you, you could argue, okay, well, that's kind of a pain. But yeah. You only have to do it once, maybe for your entire life. So that was the that was the design choice I made that sort of prevents all of this other, I mean, all of the problems of, oh my God, I forgot my password. Well, that means that there needs to be some sort of recovery and LastPass doesn't want the responsibility. So they store that in your machine. And so that creates the vulnerability. So anyway, they, they uh, in terms of recommendations for LastPass users, Activate the new account recovery over SMS. Uh, they say, and this I think is kind of impractical, audit your vault for malicious JavaScript payloads. I'm not sure how the common user would do that. Uh, don't use the password reminder. Uh, activate two-factor authentication. And then they also say add country restrictions. And their point there is that would prevent somebody who had exported your stuff from being able to log in as you somewhere else. And that's definitely, that should be top of your list as long as you're not a, a frequent international traveler, in which case that would befuddle you. Uh, so add country restrictions and disallow Tor logins because that's, of course, another way for a bad guy to, to get into your system is through a, th just through using Tor. And those are both features that you can, uh, you, you can disable for uh, a heightened security. And then they also gave LastPass corporate, Joe, uh, some suggestions. He said, th they said, get rid of the custom underscore JS file. 
uh, change the way they're encrypting the vault to do it in one chunk. Uh, or they also used ECB encryption. I forgot to mention that earlier. ECB is that that's that's the acronym for electronic code book, and that's the the non cipher mode encryption. You know, famously, w we've all seen that Wikipedia page that talks about encryption, where you see the Lin the Linux Penguin in all of its glory, like looking black, white, and yellow, and then it's encrypted under electronic code book and it's it turns it into you know gray fur but you can still see the penguin there the point is it's it's not it's not statistically sound uh it's probably all they needed but but the point was that one of the things that electronic code book is is that it doesn't cause one encryption to rely upon the output of the previous one. The chaining, you know, cipher block chaining, we've talked about CBC and all of the other chaining modes, they create an interblock dependency so that the, the blocks don't stand alone. And even the first block, it typically has an, an initialization vector that influences it. And the IV, the initialization, initialization vector, is, is is a nonce that changes all the time and it can be known it just it's good if it's unique because then you can't tell anything about what the first chunk of, of the of the encryption is the first block well, with electronic code book you're there's no chaining you're encrypting each block by itself so what it does is it does leak information because under the same key anytime you encrypt the same thing you get the same result. So you could see easily, for example, if the user were encrypting the same password on different sites because an identical, an identical encrypted version would appear on multiple sites. So they're saying, don't do that. Uh, and they also wanted them to strengthen their, their password-based key derivation function uh, suggested using certificate pinning rather than, than just relying on the the public key system. Actually, look at the at the serial number in the the or, or the hash of the certificate. Uh, they also suggested that they that LastPass embrace open source. I'm not sure how they do that though as a commercial company, uh, but it's a nice ask. Uh, and then with, they said with a little smiley face, adopt a retroactive cash reward bug bounty program although pay us they didn't find, <laughs> right they, they, retroactive they, means they, and we want some of that yeah but they didn't find any bugs this was this Good was point. there were no bugs found Good point. Th th this was a rigorous analysis and i would argue any other password manager probably suffers this or more problems one of the beauties of LastPass is that it has had it, it's been pounded on right. for quite a while in their conclusions, I quoted them in the show notes, password managers are a great tool that everyone should use. Even though we exposed weaknesses, they say, I wouldn't say that, but I, I'm reading what they wrote in LastPass, it is still a solid tool, they wrote, and a better option than using the same password or only changing the last characters of your password everywhere. There are ways to harden your LastPass configuration, which we talked about, that can avoid some of the explained attacks. Uh, watch the talk and slides for more details on that. To finish, we want to point out that the security team at LastPass responded very quickly to all our reports, and a lot of the issues were fixed in just a couple of days. It was very easy to communicate and work with them. So really, you can't ask for more than that. Yeah. In fact, you know, everything's going to have vulnerabilities. It, it, I say this all the time. You know, every pro computer is going to have a problem. It's how they respond. Yes. How quickly they fix it, whether they, you know, even listen to you. And so many times we hear security researchers say, yeah, we yeah. told them about this again and again we and gave again. Them, we gave them six months. We never heard. Yeah. So we're going public because, yeah. you know, sorry about that. You had, you had yeah. as much time as you need. So thank you, Joe, for he's, he's, his stewardship of LastPass continues to be excellent. Well, and the, the only real issues were caused by convenience. Right. And there, so, so, 
unfortunately, you know, power users could say, oh, I'm going to turn off that that uh, disabled one-time password feature. Good, turn it off. Make sure you never forget your password because if you do, they won't be able to help you. But that's the trade-off. And if the idea of something in your machine getting into your last pass a vault unnerves you, then because the, the your browser has to be able to do that, you have to take that ability away from it, in which case you're having to put in your LastPass password all the time. And, and then, see, then the problem is you're tempted to weaken it to make it easier to put it in, and then you're, it, then you're back to it being sub subject to a brute force attack. So, you know, <laughs> there are some things that don't have an answer, but uh, a set of convenience versus security trade-offs. That's that's the world. I mean, that's the real world. And something we don't do often enough, but I'm sure you do mentally, and I think our audience should do, is kind of rank the threats. Nothing's yes. perfect, but yes. if you rank the threats, you you say all the time, for instance, uh, you you if somebody's got physical access to your machine, that's a very different issue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so it's less of a threat if it requires physical access because there's you know once somebody has physical access, kind of all bets are off. So well, rank for the example, threats. Yes, all of the worms that we suffered early, you know, in the early days of this podcast, those were from ports that were open. Right. Windows left ports open. That's a big threat. And that's, <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's yeah. a big one. And that's a remote threat and yeah. bang, you know, yeah. takeover. Yeah. Didn't, you know, it's like how many million, tens of millions of machines. Very different to have, you know, finally with XP Service Pack 2 uh, and they enabled a firewall in, I mean, overnight, this, that just ended. So, and it's like, oh, okay, Microsoft, it sure did take a long time. I guess my point is it's better to use a password manager that's less of a threat than using the same password on every site or an easily guessable password on every site. That's less of a – right. that's more of a threat than this this kind of somewhat less of a threat with the, with the password recovery. Yeah, and, and it's just about understanding. Yeah. And that's, yeah, well, you know, that, that's what we're here to do with the podcast. Yeah. So uh, – I got some uh, interesting tweets about Windows 10 and the question of it being becoming a bit heavy-handed. Um, what's happened is there have been many reports of of Windows 10 silently removing software which people had previously installed after this early November update, which apparently has been causing Microsoft lots of of headaches of sort of still undisclosed nature. And I heard you talking about it uh, earlier, Leo. So I know you, I know you, you know, some about what's going on with this, you know, this, what is it? Is it 1511? I think is the number of the, of the update. But in this case, uh, for example, some, some coverage said Microsoft's first big mistake. I'm sorry, Microsoft's first big update, boy, Freudian Microsoft's first big update for its operating system as a service is deleting some user installed apps without asking Windows owners for permission, according to dozens of complaints on message boards and forums. The affected programs include hardware monitoring tools, CPU hyphen Z and Specky, as well as the AMD Catalyst Control Center for tweaking your Radeon graphics cards. In these instances, the programs apparently no longer functioned properly with the newest version of Windows 10. And Microsoft claims the apps were causing crashes and blue screens of death. While this may help most people who don't want to deal with troubleshooting their system to figure out what is wrong with it, some power PC users, I mean some PC power users, are taking issue with Windows 10 removing software without asking. Um, one poster on Reddit sort of put it nicely. He said, "When Microsoft should ask for permission and not for forgiveness. I would be fine with, if, with it if Windows 10 said, hey, this application can cause problems and we recommend that you uninstall it. Do you want us to do that for you? And then, as this guy wrote, shuts its mouth about it if you say no, but they shouldn't just uninstall it without prior warning. And so my observation from... 10,000 feet is that Windows is evolving into a different sort of beast. Uh, it's evolving into a connected service rather than 
you know, what we have traditionally That's known exactly as an operating right. system. That's uh, exactly right. Yeah, even Microsoft has kind of said that, right? Yeah. Yeah. One, one Windows. Uh, they've said this is, you know, that's the kind of implication of things like this is the last win, the last version of Windows. Right. right. From now on, it's just a, a forever to be updated. It's SAS. Yeah, and and I and I think I think what we're probably going to see is this creating more pressure for diehard Windows users to give alternatives a look. Maybe you know Linux will inherit a percentage of previous Windows users who just sort of finally say, you know, this isn't what I want, and which is fine. Microsoft doesn't want them either. That's not who Windows 10 is for. Windows 10 is, you know, for the majority of people who do, you know, sort of like the, the more like the profile of the, of the, um, the Chromebook user who, who just wants it to work. Doesn't want to have lots of problems. Just please, you know, make it work. But, you know, they need to use Windows apps. So Microsoft is sort of heading in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, remember Microsoft, Windows is still primarily a business operating system. Right. And I think they're trying to do, you know, it is a communication issue. He's right. They should have asked. Be a simple thing to pop up a dialogue saying, hey, we know that, you know, Whatever it is, ZCPO UID doesn't doesn't causes crashes. Uh, we'd like to remove it. I think it's a little easier to explain the AMD Catalyst Control Center because that's essentially the the video driver, and so it's an out of date video driver. I'm sure for years they've been taking those off. So uh, I, I saw something in digging around that said that that Microsoft had deliberately muted its install, and it, it's possible that this is a mistake. Yeah, that, I mean, right. we're seeing Microsoft making more mistakes with Windows 10. Uh, you probably know from talking to Paul that they hugely cut back their their uh, testing side, so much so that like, developers are now having to test their own right. code right. rather than being a. I mean, and I know as a developer, I can't test my own code. It's why the the GRC news groups are so fabulous uh, for me. Is you know, it's just not possible yeah, it's to like test an what you wrote. Proofreading his own copy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, and I also think that this is also driven somewhat by mobile. That people that the expectations people have with their mobile phone is that all of this this would be normal behavior probably on a mobile phone, and so Microsoft saying, "Hey, well, this is how you know we do mobile operating systems. Why shouldn't we do desktops this way?" Yeah, and so yeah, I think the na the nature is changing. I'm uh, I'm going to surprise people with this next one. This is a report of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office on smartphone encryption and public safety. The, it's a 42-page report, although only half of it, the, the, the second half is all kind of addenda and references and things. Uh, it's important enough that I created a bit.ly link for it. And why is what's the first bit.ly link? Because I remembered that I made an a, I put an A on the end because I'd already used the first bit.ly link. I don't, I don't see what uh, any, anyway. <laughs> and what did I do? Maybe you made uh, a mistake the first time. What happens if you do a bit.ly bit.ly slash sn hyphen five three five? Now kids, don't what try this up? at home because yeah, something's going to come up. It says Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. Oh my God, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my lord that's that yes that's down for the miscellany so we okay, will be that's later that. today <laughs> yeah don't don't anybody put that in uh okay okay so uh but if you if you add an a bit.ly slash sn hyphen five three five a then you will get the um uh, uh the pdf that I'm going to refer to. And and I would commend some listeners who are interested to to take some time. I'm just gonna read through the foreword and, and one paragraph from the executive summary. So to give you a sense for it, but also, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting. Foreword, most people today live their lives on smartphones. And in this regard, at least, criminals are no different. While in the past, criminals have kept evidence of their crimes in file cabinets, closets, and safes, today that evidence is more often found on smartphones. Photos and videos of child sexual assault, 
text messages between sex traffickers and their customers, even a video of a murder victim being shot to death. These are, I mean, no, I know this is overly dramatic, but we'll, we'll hold on. These are just a few of the pieces of evidence found on smartphones and used to prosecute people committing horrific crimes. And this is a little pointed, but still. Last fall, a decision by a single company, <laughs> we know where they're aiming, changed the way those of us in law enforcement work to keep the public safe and bring justice to victims and their families. In September 2014, Apple Inc. announced that its new operating system for smartphones and tablets would employ by default what is commonly referred to as full disk encryption, making data on its devices completely inaccessible without a passcode. Shortly thereafter, Google Inc. announced it would do the same. Apple's and Google's decisions to enable full disk encryption by default on smartphones means that law enforcement officials can no longer access evidence of crimes stored on smartphones, even though the officials have a search warrant issued by a neutral judge. Apple and Google are not responsible for keeping the public safe. That's the job of law enforcement. But the consequences of these companies' actions on the public safety are severe. That is why my office has been working with our law enforcement partners around the world to craft the solution recommended in this report. We believe there is a responsible way to balance safety and security. And then I'm skipping down to part five in the executive summary, which follows the foreword, where they write part five sets, and this is the summary of part five, sets forth a proposed solution. Congress should enact a statute that requires, and listen to the wording carefully, any designer of an operating system for a smartphone or tablet manufactured, leased, or sold in the U.S. to ensure that data on its devices is accessible pursuant to a search warrant. Such a law would be well within Congress's Commerce Clause powers and does not require costly or difficult technological innovations. And I agree. What? Yes, I think really? that's the right solution. I think that's where we're probably going to go. And I think that's where we're going to end. Um, this does not mean a back door. This means essentially that under court order, Apple can be compelled to provide something or to unlock a phone that they're given much as they have been able to prior to iOS eight. Um, it's a backdoor, but Apple has the keys. Only Apple well, and has the keys. yes, and that's the point. And that's that's why this proposal makes sense. And they are they're not asking for data in flight. They're not asking for on the fly decryption. They're just saying it is the case that phones are in, are massively evidentiary, and you know, and and we live in a in a in a country in the U.S. I'm talking about, of course, where if law enforcement gets a judge to agree, your home can be broken into. You may not like it, but your home can be searched. Your car can be searched. I mean, that's, that's, that's the balance that has traditionally been struck and uh, that we're all living with rather happily now. The question has been, how does technology um, confound this? And... The, the, the point here is this is not a key that the government has. This is not any sort of a master key. This would not be an algorithm where if it got loose, suddenly all Apple iPhones and iOS devices would then be subject to, to break in. The, if, Apple could do it right. And what, that, what doing it right means is 
you know, Apple has a an ongoing relationship with all the devices that are tethered to them. It would mean a a high quality random key stored in that secure element, which 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 would be unique and unchangeable in every phone, which Apple would secure at their end and which under subpoena from law enforcement would enable the phone to be unlocked. And uh, to me, um, the, the, the remaining issue is that does this create a slippery slope? It, you know, is there like, oh, well, if we can have that, can we, you know, what more can we well, get? Well, you know, I was thinking that because really a lot of criminals meet in uh, private in homes and apartments, uh, exchange child pornography, plan terrorist attacks. I think apartment buildings should be required to put a microphone in every apartment. And, and then that way with federal law enforcement subpoena or warrant uh, could turn those microphones on. I think that's another good idea. The problem is... <laughs> It, I think law enforcement, I look, I, I understand we would like to catch criminals and bad guys, but I think law enforcement overreaches a little bit. And uh, this sounds like an overreach. I can't agree with you, Steve. This is an overreach. Okay. I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, you're right. This is not saying, it's not a key escrow. It's not, you know, it, it is with, with warrant. It's no different than it was a few years back. Correct. Uh, I didn't encrypt my uh, Google phones uh, usually, but now, of course, all my Google phones with since uh, five point, Android 5.0 and all my iPhones are, are encrypted. I didn't do it. They just do it automatically for me. Um, it's an interesting question. Yeah, I think it's going to happen, and if it does, I could live with it. I think that's my point, is I, I, I don't think there's an argument, a sound argument, on, I mean, and, and, and I should say, Leo, I also get your point. I mean, completely. Um, uh, and so there will no doubt be an interesting debate. But the, there, are, there are huge technological arguments th that we've discussed that make this probably impossible for data in transit. And, and that's not what's being asked for here. This yeah, is, you know, one of the reasons I think Google uh, started doing this and Apple started doing this is not because of the U.S. government, but because of com countries like China, which, by the way, is could say exactly this paragraph, except replace the words "manufactured, leased, or sold" in the U.S. with "manufactured, leased, or sold in China." Yeah. And what Google doesn't want to do, you remember, Yahoo was forced to turn over emails uh, from a Chinese dissident who was then prosecuted and executed. Yeah. Um, I think what, what Google and Apple both saw the writing on the wall, and is, it wasn't it, the U.S. They, government they were worried about. They don't about. want the responsibility. They don't want to be, right? they don't want to be put in a position where a government of any kind, U.S. or Chinese, could come to them right. and say, you got to reveal this information. So that's why they're, they really don't want this. And uh, as soon as this happens, of course, that's, it's not just going to be the U.S. government, it's going to be every other government in the world. Yeah. And so I, I don't think Apple did this particularly to protect our privacy. I think they they just they wanted to get out of the fray. Well, and you can imagine, you know, we covered the stories of the three-month backlog right. that they had in the iOS 7 era where, where essentially they were having to brute force their own customers' phones because brute forcing was possible. And so law enforcement would get a subpoena. They hated it, would, yeah would hand them the phone right. and say, you know, we need this as soon as possible. Right. And Apple was like, ah, well, we got about a 90-day backlog at the moment, which upset law enforcement. And so you could imagine Apple just saying, you know, let's just fix this and let's sell privacy because, and, you know, and we know that Tim's been selling privacy. Yeah. You know, it, it's, been a, it's been a benefit. Is it but, unreasonable to say to law enforcement, well, you also had other means than looking at somebody's smartphone of finding and prosecuting criminals um you didn't always you know and it wasn't necessarily because you could see into their data is it un, is it not unreasonable to say you know there are plenty of other police methods i mean torture works too but or maybe it doesn't there's some debate over that but <laughs> assuming that torture worked doesn't mean you should use it yeah i i i mean i'm with you completely uh but i also I'm watching what's going on. I'm sure you've heard McCain, you know, announcing that there will be 
hearings. And it's yeah. like, oh, okay, here we go. I no, mean, I think you, you know, might this, be right. This, I, think I don't this know how happen. this issue gets resolved. Yeah. Well, I, I know how I would like it to get resolved, which is stay out of my stuff. And, uh, and if that, you know, I think it's, there's very clear evidence that law enforcement would love to implement mass surveillance. Oh, wait a minute. They already did. Yep. So um, let's not make this any easier for them than it is. Yep. But I understand. I, you know, on the other hand, being a good liberal, I'm listening to your point of view, and I understand what you're saying. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. There, there's, uh, it's a very, it's a very tough question. I, I guess, I guess the, the to me, and I'm not a legal scholar nor a constitutional scholar, but this feels proportional. Right. It feels like this is like what we have with existing. Uh, subpoenas and court orders where where a neutral judge weighs the evidence and says, okay, yeah, you know, there's reasonable reason to believe and that and that that law I mean we want law enforcement to be effective. We'd like bad guys to get caught. And frankly, I'm I mean and, and, and the argument, you know, that I don't have anything on my phone, well that's we know that's not the argument. It's, you know, is this, is, should the phone be, have content which is protected? You know, absolutely inaccessible. Well, to make and, the point in your favor, um, with a warrant, law enforcement could come into your home, search your file cabinets, search all your possessions, search as long as there's a warrant, they yep. have the right to do that. Uh, and I think you're probably, it's, I would submit that there's much more private stuff in your home than there is on your smartphone. So yeah. why should the smartphone... Uh, have some sort of special protection that your home right. does not. So uh, that's the argument on the other side. So this this document also had a couple of little tasty tidbits that I, that I knew that our listeners would find interesting. Uh, and, uh, that I mean, just for just as as fact, um, under the difficulty of getting passcodes from defendants, there was some interesting new information to me. Uh, they wrote. Case law holds almost universally that a defendant cannot be compelled uh, by, for example, a grand jury subpoena or order of the court to provide the government with her or his passcode. Of course, we've talked about this often because such compulsion would violate the defendant's Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. There are two potential exceptions to this rule, which is what I found interesting and wanted to share. First, it is an open question whether instead of being compelled to provide the government with a passcode, the defendant might be compelled to unlock her or his phone using the passcode. There have been no cases considering this precise question. And although a court might conclude that, it's, that it is no different from the situation in which a defendant is compelled to provide the government with the passcode, it might also determine that the situations are somewhat different. Meaning, don't tell us your secret, but here's your phone. You must use that secret, which you're allowed to keep secret, in order to give us access, in order to unlock the phone. So that's, the point was, that's an open and different question. And then secondly, if the evidence, I'm sorry, if the existence of evidence on the phone is a foregone conclusion, then the defendant may have no Fifth Amendment privilege with respect to the contents of the phone and thus may be compelled to provide the government with the passcode. It would be difficult in most, in most circumstances, however, for the government to establish with the requisite degree of certainty the existence of evidence in a phone that would clear the foregone conclusion hurdle. But anyway, from a legal standpoint, I'm, this is the kind of stuff that Denise knows cold, but what this says is Fifth Amendment privilege only only extends where there's suspicion, but n essentially not proof. But the idea being they would they would be able to demonstrate what is in the phone, and then that would not uh, allow the person to claim Fifth yeah. Amendment. I don't think that's anything uh, new. Privilege. I think that's consistent. Right. Yeah, right. That's consistent with, with uh, prior law. And, and then they just finish. In any event, even if the government could lawfully compel a defendant to disclose his or her passcode, meaning even if those other things applied to open her or his phone using the passcode, 
there's substantial likelihood that any defendant who faces potentially serious criminal charges would simply refuse to comply with a subpoena or order and go into contempt. So, so if, anyway, let's say Google and Apple decide, uh, you know, those lawmakers pass along Google and Apple comply and uh, turn off the full disk encryption or, or make it optional. Is well, there, no, no, not that. Not neither of those. It would be a that, back door. That, well, what, not, what, well, well, their back that, door. That, that's a loaded term. Have have the ability to under court order right. on a phone by phone basis that they are able to unlock it. That's what that's if, what this asks for. But okay, so TrueCrypt uh, does full disk encryption. Yep. Um, I maybe because the nature of the mobile platform, you can't go out and get a third party full disk encryption utility on your smartphone. Right. Right. Now, for for example, but what about uh, what wouldn't somebody wouldn't, use, wouldn't somebody government using, want to ban TrueCrypt at the same time? Otherwise, the same somebody, problems. Somebody using Threema, for example, yeah. you know, Threema has in your phone a log of your of your dialogue, yet it is stored encrypted. Right. So, so if you were using Threema, then Apple unlocking your phone would give nobody visibility into Threema because its security is absolute. So, so, there. <laughs> so, well, that kind of is my point, which is, right. What's who's this going to catch? Right. Um, yeah. This is going to th this this turns back the clock a couple years yeah. to the way we were before. But where, the good news is terrorists can still use encrypted communications, so we're okay. Wait, now say that again? The good news is... <laughs> terrorists, ter terrorists and pederasts can still, use. can still use encryption, so we're okay. No, the, the good news is mom and I yeah. can discuss you what don't get she's any cooking privacy. for Thanksgiving, <laughs> no, no. and nobody you, can You get see no it. privacy. It's, nobody, the, it's the bad no. guys who will I've have the incentive. On, I've got mom up on three so the Threema? NSA does wow. not know what mom's cranberry wow. sauce there's recipe a, is. There's now a flag. That is secret. There's now a flag on you and mom in the NSA headquarters, <laughs> I might add. Um, and, and, and by the way, what's next? you got to ban TrueCrypt, right? You, you got to well, ban. You got to. You know, this is why I backed away from, from, from CryptoLink, my own you know, nascent VPN was that I was worried that what's coming is no one can offer encryption without providing a backdoor. Yeah. So see, that's so my point that's, is, the, that's the slippery slope. Is that once you accept part. once you accept the premise that government needs to be able to search anything and encryption yes. confounds that. Yes. Then and oh well, you know the nice thing is it's easy to do on a smartphone. You just tell Apple and Google keep a keep a key, would you? Uh, but it's not. But then that's you've accepted the premise. Yes. So now, well, well, if you you know nobody has the right to encryption. Yes. That's uh, invulnerable to a search warrant. Then we got to ban all these other things, or maybe get them to put a back door on it. Like I said, Leo, I just bye love, bye BitLocker. I love this era that we're in. <laughs> this is just it is so full of interesting balancing questions um and i mean really good ones because again we would like law enforcement to be at, to have the information it needs but not at the at the cost of sacrificing global privacy right and 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 my, so my point is this particular niche doesn't so sacrifice global privacy this cor this this comports with the way the U.S. Constitution provides search for, uh, you know, for in, in the instance of reasonable suspicion. And so to me, I'll, I, I don't know how you resist this, but I, I certainly acknowledge the slippery slope yeah. problem. That this, or this yeah, because you really up. haven't Again. solved anything just by the cell phone thing. you got to really go farther if you want to stop these child molesters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just so it's okay. so difficult. It is interesting. So uh, I just wanted to mention that a bunch of our my followers have been tweeting that they're in receipt of Let's Encrypt beta invitations. So as 2015 nears the end, uh, Let's Encrypt, Encrypt is kind of incrementally and carefully rolling its service out, making it available to sites 
Uh, I think this is exactly the way you, the way you do something like this is, you know, you you get some experience, you fold that back and you you deal with any problems before you turn the whole world loose on it, because I think it's going to be quite popular. So miscellaneous goodies. Um, I did want to mention that while it seemed like last week our discussion of the whole <laughs> the whole crypto controversy, which where we've been spending a lot of time, might have been a rehash, many people got a lot from it. I think you know we, we we in some ways we took it further than we had, used some different analogies than we had, and and uh, it it ended up being really useful. Uh, and one favorite tweet that several people sent me, uh, I, I don't know that Ben Hughes, it, it, it was its originator, but it's such a perfect gotcha that I, I had, had to share it with everybody. So uh, uh, he tweeted, if banning encryption would stop terrorists from using it, why don't they just make terrorism illegal and be done with it? There you go. Which I thought, ooh, boy, that's that's perfect. That that's if a banning, variation of if they ban, if they outlaw guns, only outlaws will have guns. Yeah, precisely. Yeah, if, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, also, uh, look at that screenshot on the next page, Leo. Okay. I wanted to let people know. I just wanted to close Show the, off. <laughs> close the <laughs> the the loop here. Uh, I've been. And our listeners and and viewers know we've had zero problems. We're back to like fabulous connections. The the initial switchover from my pair of T1s uh, was causing some trouble due to my LAN uh, issues as I was recabling and changing switches and things. Uh, then a friend of mine in Atlanta with Cox sent me a a beautiful Netgear CM600 which is the, the, the now available, recently certified by, by Cox. He was just waiting for Cox to certify it. 24 downstream channels and eight upstream channels. So I am now on multiple different bandwidth meters getting 341 megabits down and 33 megabits up for, let's see, that's... Uh, when I had the two T1s, I had, a, I had a, they were bonded, so I was getting 3.54 <laughs> megabits. In, in, in other words, Symmetric. one, one, one hundredth yeah. of what I'm getting now. Probably for a lot more money, even, right? Uh, yes, and I was paying something like four sixty yeah. a month. This is something like seventy dollars, uh, and I'm, I, I mean, I'm not even sure of that. It might be less. Now, but which speed test did you use for this? Uh, this, this, this one is speedtest.net. Yeah, I'd be but careful I used, because uh, I know I yeah. use DSL. Okay, I use DSL yeah. and and a couple others, and they were all comparable. There's some so. evidence that uh, ISPs note which one you're using and tune their performance. Well, it's <laughs> suitably. yes, it's absolutely the case that they know what yeah. IP yeah. I'm going to, right. and they could unthrottle yeah. my connection. Oh, turn them up real quick. Yep. However, I have to say, um, last night, <clears throat> when I downloaded the first episode of the new Sci-Fi Expanse series oh. that we'll be talking about in a minute, uh, it came down very nicely. Oh, and I finally found a good use for my iPad Pro. But anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Um, oh, you're not giving also, it back, huh? <laughs> uh, uh, all, yeah, actually, the, the darn pencil hasn't shipped yet. And so I you got to wait for that. You got to wait for yeah, that. I, yeah, I have to, I have yeah. to have that experience. Yeah. But I also wanted a quick Oralux follow up. Uh, it's very clear from many of the tweets, uh, agonizing in some cases, tweets. Uh, that overall productivity among a significant subset of our listeners <laughs> has Damn you, Gibson. Significant, <laughs> has significantly collapsed this past week as a consequence of Oralux. And I'm just everybody is thankful not only for Thanksgiving, but they're thankful that there will there that there's a four day weekend coming up. Yeah. So 
they may be able to make some progress on Oralux. So I made it's it my, huge... uh, my pick for the uh, app cap for iOS today. I just, it's so uh, much fun and it's so good. challenging. It, this is hard. Yeah. Now, remember when you were saying, oh, it's so slow? I, and I was thinking, oh, Leo, just wait. <laughs> I, I'm like, I'm going bing, 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 bing. I'm like, you know, marshalling forces and sending them. And yeah, it, I mean, it really is. And there are some, I mean, there's one I, I'm still scratching my head on. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the, this is the this is normal. They call this one a normal one. There's some of them are really hard when you get when you get into the hard ones. Um, oh, they're they're like, hey, they get to wait a minute. They get to start with four planets and you got one. What the yeah. what? So. And the other thing you notice where like they they set up sort of a streaming effect where the last guy sends it to the next guy who sends it to the next guy and it builds up this current. I mean, th anyway, there it's just wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and so for it's anyone hard, who missed though. last week's podcast, available for, on iOS platform and on Android, Auralux, A-U-R-A-L-U-X. Um, it's a goodie. I'm trying yeah. to, if I get the center star to, to build up, I might yep. have a shot. I want to get yeah, the orange and the green. you got to get your little blue guys in Look at I just lost to... this planet, I know. <laughs> and now they're going to invade me. Oh, I hate uh, that. I want to play yeah, against real humans, though. They need to add a uh, online version of this because the AI, like the AI, should when when one of the when like Orange gets the center planet, Green should try to get him out of there. Instead, he's still attacking me. It's like, come on, pay attention. You know, <laughs> don't bother with me. Yeah, I'm go not after your each problem. Other. Oh, I've just lost yeah. the whole game. Oh, yeah. there it goes. It's over. It's, it really it's is over, frustrating. Man, it's over. Okay, so yesterday, uh, Sci Fi Channel, and I spelled it wrong here S Y F Y, unfortunately, um, released a tease for the December, I think it's December 10th, the series officially starts. And this is the Expanse series we knew it was coming oh, about nine months ago i guess because i read the whole series because the the books are always better and so i read them in advance of seeing the movie just so that i would know it's available on apple tv itunes the google play store and comcast on demand and probably other places i looked for it on fire tv but i i didn't it i didn't see it there um so this is the first episode 44 minutes blessedly commercial free um and you can see where the commercial breaks are um and uh, i don't know um the very first opening vignette and you know i'm not going to give any spoilers uh was extremely awkward and unclear um whereas of course i know exactly what happened because i read the book but nobody watching the first beginning of the first episode would have any idea what that was um so i'm worried that you know the book which was was rich with narrative may not trans work, translate very well but we do have a new sci-fi series starting officially uh, in early december and you can see the first episode now so i wanted to make sure that our our sci-fi avid listeners knew and i know that we've got a, a bunch of them Okay, back to that uh, <laughs> bit.ly slash sn hyphen 535. This Kept is it around just in case you were going back. This to week's difficult to beat. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> Everybody. Bit.ly slash bit dot ly slash sn hyphen 535. All lowercase. This is from... The Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, uh, and in little tiny fine print at the bottom, it says this page requires a password, and, uh, and those are two separate words, which allows the user to locate wells for filing of sundries form four. Please call if you have any questions or problems. Now, unf <laughs> unfortunately, the page, which has this, this fill-in for your password, explains that you should be very careful not to use any special characters, and it gives them all to you, because 
the SQL server, which they have interpreting what you send, will pick that up and treat them as SQL commands. So it's like, okay, you know, wow. My password is little Johnny drop tables. Little Johnny <laughs> drop tables. Yep. Exactly. Well, now they even tell you ahead of time. Hey, I'd, just you know, just so you know, try not to use any SQL commands in your password. <laughs> just you know, to and be safe. They're using they're using a GET query rather than a POST. I saw somebody who actually did put something in there say that the what they put in was in the URL. So once again, you know, and and, and someone commented, it's a lot. It's like IT set it up for the secret, like for the office secretary. Yeah. Yeah, just to make use. it monkey one two three and be done with it. Come on. Wow. Yeah. It's written in Cold Fusion. If that tells you anything. Wow. Wow. Now, um, I tweet the show note link every week, and I get people asking me for the show note link. I also tweet things that I think will be interesting. Like last night, I tweeted that the first episode of Expanse, of the Expanse series, was available. And, uh, of course, you know, I, I, I don't tweet a lot. I'm not a high-volume tweeter. Many people are still not on the Twitter. I get it. I understand. But I wanted to make sure that people knew that it would be possible to, for example, follow me or any other people, low-volume tweeters, um, with SMS. That still works and exists. And, and the other problem is people who are on Twitter sometimes follow 3,000 people. So my very occasional tweets will, are just going to be lost in the noise. You'll never see them. They'll, they'll scroll right off into oblivion. So in the U.S., all the carriers use 40404. And so, for example, if you were to if you were to tweet the string follow space S G G R C to the uh, to the recipient four oh four oh four, your that that's telling Twitter that when I tweet something, which I rarely do, but that you don't want to miss, you'll receive it as a text message. So I just want to make sure people knew there was an, you know, for whatever reason, people not using Twitter who are sending me uh, email, actually. I don't, I don't see tweets from them because they're not on Twitter, but email saying, hey, you know, where's the link for last week's show notes? Well, you know, I always tweet it. So people can follow me if they care just using SMS, which is something some people forget. You don't have to even have a, a Twitter subscription. Now, errata. Uh, <laughs> it turns out that I completely, it's, it's, and, and when the moment <laughs> I'm interrupting myself, but the moment I saw this is like, oh my Lord, it's like seeing a typo where you say your, uh, and you meant Y O U apostrophe or E, that. Yeah. but, but you write your Y O U R. Think you, didn't know you know, better. you know, better, yeah. you know, the difference, but that's the way it came out. So anyway, I appreciated finding this in the mailbag uh, from someone who I guess his name is Hakan, although he's got some Unicode craziness in his name. He is in Sweden. Uh, he says, hi. Regarding wildcard certificates, I think you mixed things up a bit. Oh, boy, did I. Wildcard certificates do not require SNI. SNI only matters if the server wants to use multiple certificates on the same IP, there's no problem with just multiple names supported by the same certificate on a single IP. You can use a single wildcard certificate supporting all the subdomains you like with no need for SNI. Now, to wind the clock back two weeks, that was me misanswering a question from someone who wanted, who was, who's, whose hosting provider was saying, oh, you've been a loyal customer. Thank you for renewing. We're going to give you, uh, you know, secure access to your website. Uh, and they were doing it, I was sure, by having a cert that was star dot, you know, alshostingservice.com. 
And then I got it all mixed up saying that that required server name identification, which is SNI. It doesn't. So thank you very much for the correction. Uh, and I want to make sure I correct the record because, uh, for example, um, GRC has three different domains uh, which are covered, but I use an EV certificate that does not allow wildcards. Uh, uh, and, uh, and if I had a star dot certificate, then that doesn't need SNI. And I, so I explained the SNI thing correctly last week about the need to select the certificate on the fly, except I mashed it together with the, with the wildcard cert, which does not need server name identification because it's, it's the same cert is being, you know, is being matched uh, with, with the pattern of all, thus the asterisk. Stanley, and finally, on the short code thing, um, I don't know if this would happen to everybody, but turning on your short codes on Twitter now means that everybody else, I'm getting everybody else's texts as well. So, turning so on. So as soon as I said I should follow SGGRC, I'm now getting John Len, uh, Don Lemon from CNN and Jason. In other words, my, my text messages are filling up. So I think you, you, what you're, you might be turning on in general... <laughs> oh, is the setting in your Twitter account for Enable yeah. Mobile. And if you have a mobile number registered with them, it'll say, oh, I know this number. Let me send you everything. Ah, and that's not what got you it. want. <laughs> so you might no. have to go into your settings to modify it. Sorry behavior. about that. You know, that's yes. I just wanted to clarify that because some people yeah, are going to have good. that happen. Good. Um, Keegan R. Griffiths in Australia I found this in the mailbag on the 20th of November, said, Hello, Steve. I've been watching slash listening to SN for about six months now and absolutely love it. I have a question about Spinrite. In recent podcasts, some Spinrite stories have mentioned running it on SSDs. And I'd like to ask if and how Spinrite can repair issues on SSDs as it was developed for mechanical drives that are quite different from their solid-state counterparts. Keep up the great work. I hope Leo and yourself continue this wonderful service for many years to come. So uh, I have covered this in the past, but Keegan and anyone who's joined more recently, I'll just explain that it is true that, that Spinrite obviously was developed in the pre-SSD era, but... What has come to light in the in in recent uh, increase uh, with SSD use and density, and and popularity and reduction in prices that's made them affordable, is the 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 solid state drive manufacturers have unfortunately played the same game that the hard drive manufacturers have played, and that is they've allowed the the pressure to increase densities and lower costs to push their technology, different as it is, into sort of a gray zone where they're relying on math in order to, to where necessary, resolve ambiguity in the data that's recorded. And the point is that they, they've... They've, their density is so high that they can't always get back the ones and zero bits exactly the way they wrote them. They can get them mostly back the way they wrote them, and then they rely on error correction to correct those that were a little too fuzzy and that read back as the wrong bit or the bit set the wrong way. So... So much as we would like to believe that SSDs are like RAM, that like they're just, they're solid state and they're not prone, unfortunately, uh, that's not the case. And in fact, we just saw some coverage of them adding more bits to the cell. For example, the SSDs I managed to purchase were single level cell SSDs a few years ago. I don't even think you can get those anymore. Because the idea being the, the, the single bit cell will only store a one or a zero. That is a voltage, a charge 
of either fully charged or fully discharged. But that meant the st that cell only had two states, one or zero. Then someone said, hey, uh, if, we, if we store either no charge, uh, a third of a charge, two-thirds of a charge, or a full charge, that's four states or two bits. And so we can double the density of the SSD like for free. Unfortunately, of course, it wasn't quite for free because now your, your, your charge discriminator has to be much more accurate and you're going to tend to be more in the gray zone. And But what we, again, recently heard was they'd gone to three bits meaning eight different levels of charge. And again, more reliance on correction. So it turns out that the, by happy coincidence, the, all of the technology that I developed for doing really deep hard drive recovery exactly maps onto the same technology, actually almost, because I do, I do some seeks back and forth uh, in order to get the heads repositioned in a different location every time I do a read. Uh, that's obviously not going to help us with an SSD, and that'll be one of the things that 6.1 eliminates when it sees that it's on an SSD, because it'll be explicitly SSD aware. So SpinRite will get better with SSDs, but already is able to recover, because it turns out uh, there's enough similarity in the way they both store data that SpinRite is able to recover from either. Nice. It's a happy accident. Let's take a little uh, break. I got questions for you, Steve, if you've got Well, answers. but not many. <laughs> because well, we're kind of running out of time. Up, we've used up an hour and three quarters it's, getting to this point. It's just I think so, time. So let's do as many as we can. Yeah. yeah. And, then, uh, and then we'll just continue next week no because, uh, because we want to hear from our because, listeners. Because we can. If yes, we can. Uh, our show today brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell, a great solution and a great gift for anybody who wants to kind of keep an eye on what's going on outside the front door. Ring is, uh, you've heard me talk about my Ring Video Doorbell. I love it. In fact, I was just, <laughs> it's so funny because everybody around the studio now has Ring Video Doorbells. So one of the, one of the things that happens is, uh, all of our devices are ringing all the time. And I see Mike Elgin checking who's at his doorbell. Uh, it's useful for a lot of things. For instance, I know that uh, the maids came uh, at exactly uh, 2.30 this afternoon, and they left about two hours before they were supposed to leave and things like that. And this is the kind of stuff. My teenage daughter came home at 3 in the morning. This is the kind of stuff the Ring Video Doorbell tells you. What's cool about it is it's not only a, a door answerer. So when somebody rings the doorbell, you can actually answer the doorbell uh, and talk to them. It's also kind of a monitor, a motion sensor. They're keeping an eye on what's going on on your front stoop. It's easy to install. It replaces, if you have a, a wired doorbell, it'll just replace that. But if you don't have a wired doorbell, um, it'll also add a doorbell because it's got a battery in it and everything. So let me show you uh, the Ring Video Doorbell. It's about 200 bucks. I'm going to show you I can get free shipping. So if you want to give this, it would be a great gift, especially for like uh, older parents maybe, uh, kids. It's easy to install. If you have a wired doorbell, all you have to do is it's two screws holding the regular ding-dong doorbell in. Those uh, Remove that, and you'll see two wires coming out of your door jam. You connect them to these terminals, mount this pit plate. They give you everything you need, a drill bit if you need it, a uh, screwdriver. They even give you a little level, so you can actually make this exactly level. And then you mount the doorbell on it. Now, what's nice about the Ring Video Doorbell, as I said, is if it's not wired, you can charge it. So it's got a little USB port, and that'll give you about a year of doorbell. You get a video camera on the front with a nice wide-angle lens so you can see everything that's going on, a microphone and a speaker. So you can answer the door. And by the way, it ties, to, ties into your uh, Wi-Fi. So you can answer the door not just from inside the house, but anywhere that you can reach with your Wi-Fi. Which means I can answer the door. In fact, I was just looking at the uh, pictures from our house at work. It's a really cool idea. And it works beautifully. 
The easiest thing to set up, I'm no handyman, took me no time at all, paired with the Wi-Fi in a snap. Uh, if this time of year you're getting packages on the front porch, it's nice to be able to say to the uh, delivery guy, hey, leave them there. And then keep an eye on them, too, by the way. Uh, you'll get an instant alert and an HD video of the whole thing if somebody tries to take those packages. It's like having somebody keeping an eye on your home 24-7. I love the ring. Get it right now at ring.com slash security now. Expedited FedEx shipping, so you'll get plenty of time for the holidays. Time Magazine said it was one of their top 10 gadgets for 2014. Richard Branson is such a great story. Uh, the Virgin guy, he was on their, his island, Necker Island, had a guest who was visiting, I think, from Boston. And uh, he's sitting, you know, enjoying the sun in the, in the Caribbean, relaxing. The guy pulls out his cell phone, goes, yeah, uh, I'm in the bathtub. Just leave it uh, on the front porch. And Brent says, what the heck was that? Um, my doorbell uh, rang in Boston. I was just telling the delivery guy to leave the package, and I'll have somebody go by and get it. Brent says, what are you talking about? So he told him the whole story of Ring. Branson, short story, has just invested $28 million in the Ring video doorbell. <laughs> Word of mouth is very good on this thing. I want to tell you about it, and I want you to get one for yourself. And you know what? Maybe for friends and family, too. Ring.com slash security now. Free FedEx shipping, expedited FedEx shipping, so you'll get it quick. Plenty of time to wrap it up and give it at the holidays. We're giving uh, more than a couple of our family members Ring video doorbells this year. It's a great gift. Ring.com slash security now. Steve Gibson is here. I have your PDF with all the questions, let me uh, let me open it, and uh, we will get underway. Questions, starting with Justin. And now I never know how to pronounce it. Is it Olafi, Kansas? Is that correct? You know, I was glad you were going to have to, because <laughs> I I thought you know I'm I messed up. Guinness or Guineas or Guineas was pretty was funny. I the Guineas Book week. of World Records. Yeah. yeah. I think it's Olathe. Chat room. It's Olathe, right? Anyway, he says, I've received an automated email. This is interesting. From, I mean, let me close out the slideshow mode. Thank you. I don't want to see a slideshow. Um, I received an automated email from Amazon saying, as part of a routine monitoring, which they perform on email addresses and passwords. Included in lists of non-Amazon-related breaches and hacks. Wow. They found the yeah. email associated with my Amazon account and preemptively reset my password. Whoa. It's the first time I've ever encountered a site that proactively scanned the lists. Maybe they were using uh, Troy Hunt's Have I Been Pwned.com, he posits, or a similar list Amazon maintains. Are you aware, is this a common practice among companies with large web presences like the Amazons of the world? I can't wait for Squirrel to be widely available and hopefully provide a robust solution to these continual password woes. I might so, add to that, by the way, Amazon turned on two-factor authentication. Just yes, recently. May, or you mean may, made available two-factor authentication. Right, they didn't turn it on. You have to turn it on, but it's now available, which is good news. So uh, 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 Justin's note was nice enough to enclose the email uh, from Amazon, which says, this is an important message from Amazon.com. At Amazon, we take your security and privacy very seriously. As part of routine monitoring, we discovered a list of email address and password sets posted online. While the list was not Amazon related, we know that many customers reuse their passwords on several websites. We believe your email address and password set was on that list. Wow. So we have taken the precaution of resetting your Amazon.com password. We apologize for any inconvenience this has caused, but felt that it was necessary to help protect you and your Amazon account. To regain access to your Amazon account or Amazon customer account, it says one, go to Amazon.com. And I love that they didn't say click this link. Good. They said go to Amazon.com and click the your account link at the top of our website. Click the link that says, forgot your password. Follow the instructions to set a new password for your account. 
please choose a new password and do not use the same password you used with us previously. Reasonable. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. we're gonna, you're going to get another email uh, from us I tomorrow. I hope so, yeah. We also highly recommend that you choose a password that you are not using on any other sites. We look forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully the person doesn't disappear forever now. Uh, sincerely, Amazon.com. So, first of all, uh, very impressive. I mean, th th this being proactive like this is, yeah. you know, I, I, I echo your reaction upon learning of this, yeah. Leo. Good, good it's job, like, Amazon. Wow. Yeah. And very nice that they didn't say click this link. The, the danger is that if this practice became widespread, then it's a perfect way for for fishers, you know, P-H-I, uh, P-H-I-S-H-E-R's, fishers, uh, to send phishing mail where they would make a slight change and say, click this link to go to Amazon.com and then, of course, send you to Amazon.com or, or some slight variation uh, and hope that you don't notice the difference and then... Uh, you know, tell you to enter, you know, log on with your old credentials so you can change it to your new ones. And of course, that would allow them access. So anyway, very, very you know, impressive. And, and, and I just loved how proactive they were. This is, uh, comes to us from um, Marco Silva in Funchal, Madeira Islands, Portugal. I'd like to go there soon. He uh, needs some browser configuration help. He says, hi, Steve and Leo. In episode 531, you re-mentioned the issue on the weak Diffie-Hellman export-grade crypto because the guys who found this issue also noticed that most servers are only using the same common 1024-bit prime. In your show notes, you have a link to an EFF article called How to Protect Yourself from NSA Attacks on 1024-Bit DH. In that article, they present some practical tips to protect yourselves. However, in the web browser section, they also show us how to remove the Diffie-Hellman crypto from various browsers. But they say it's important to note there is a trade-off here. Removing your client's support for DHE ciphers will eliminate the risk of this attack, but it may also remove forward secrecy support altogether for some sites. Ooh. So what I would like to ask you is, what should we do? Remove the DHE cipher or leave it there in order to maintain forward speed? secrecy support i have been listening almost since the beginning and love the show i hope leo is able to come oh thank you i will i'll be right there <laughs> he come to the madeira island sometime in the future it's a very beautiful place and i'm sure he'd love it here he will also like our madeira wine i do love madeira it was used to celebrate the independence of the united states i think steve will like it here too madeira and I'm never is gonna go what why not um well, because I like it right here. Are you not and a I've traveler? Got, you don't like to travel. I got a great. I got great wine. No, I'm not a traveler. In fact, uh, we've been trying to see whether there's any way to get me up for the, the new screensavers, and you don't even want to come to Petaluma, let alone Madeira. Well, the problem is, I really, as they say, there's no way to get there from here. Um, <laughs> the problem is, on the weekend, I keep hearing every one of your guests oh, yeah, talking about terrible. the traffic. Yeah, and just. But the good news is, in in talking to, um, uh, shoot, Tanya, um, uh, I was look. Uh, she, uh, she believed that she could, you guys could get me into the local airport. Yeah, it turns out well that's only from LAX. But on at the end of March, the Orange County Airport will start a direct flight to the airport that you have up there, and then you're, you're just not going to be able to get rid of me, Leo. I'm going to just be underfoot. <laughs> that would be a good way to come, actually, yeah. We, yeah. we take those planes. They're not very many a day, so you have to arrange your schedule a little bit. I only need one. Yeah, one's enough. Yeah. And we'll send the helicopter down for you sometime. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so Marco, what he's saying is that, as has been in the press, as we've talked a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were, remember, we discussed this originally months ago, then it kind of came back around because it was, th the original problem was the weakening of Diffie-Hellman. Uh, what was revealed was that due to the, the past export limits, which shortened the 
mac the maximum allowable number of bits on public key crypto to 512, there were still servers that supported 512 uh, Diffie-Hellman. And so, uh, so what was done was that uh, quickly servers were told, just stop doing that. Turn that off. And there, you know, you can go to SSL Labs, uh, you know, GRC, and, and there, there are test pages th that will show you GRC. I turned those off a long time ago. Um, but then what came back was that while the 1024-bit version doesn't have the brute force ability problem, it has a different problem, which is it's a pre-computable, computatable <laughs> pre 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 computation problem where because everyone used because technically you can you reuse the same um uh one of the same primes in Diffie Hellman it's it's still not a good idea but it turns out most of the internet uses the same one so the idea then is uh disable this Diffie Hellman Cipher. Well, now this is confusing, and this is what kind of caught Marco because there are two flavors of Diffie Hellman. There's DHE, which is Diffie Hellman ephemeral, and it's the ephemeralness that we want. That's the, the forward secrecy part where if in the future the server's keys, the server's private key became known it would not be possible to go back and decrypt everything that that server had exchanged during the lifetime of that key, which is the way it is now if you do not use an ephemeral cipher. Um, so the, the trick is that the, the elliptic curve ciphers are secure, but they're not as widely supported. They're, they've they've come along more recently. So the the this note that was made about if you disable DHE ciphers in your browser, remember that the brow the, the 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 browser the client and the server negotiate the cipher suites that they have in common, and these are cipher suites that we're discussing. If you disabled the DHE that is almost certainly available then your browser and, and, and the remote server might end up not negotiating Diffie Hel the, the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral cipher, which is increasingly available, but you have less guarantee. And so then they'd fall back to a non-Diffie-Hellman key agreement protocol, which wasn't offering the perfect forward secrecy that the ephemeral Diffie Hellman does. So, so he says, what should I do? I would say do nothing. Um, this is going to be solved for us by the browsers. There's already conversation in the industry about retiring the DH, the non-elliptic curve Diffie Hellman, just re re removing it from, from the browsers. What will happen is metrics will be put in place, Notice will be given, you know, very much like the SHA-1 issue. Um, servers will, will be told, you know, you really want to start supporting elliptic curve. We'll, we'll make sure that it's available so there's no reason why servers won't be able to support it. And then we'll just say, you know, Diffie-Hellman, uh, non-elliptic curve, uh, your day is passed. Thanks very much. So I think that's, uh, that's what's going to happen. I don't think users really ought to mess with this. Browsers will take care of it. And we know how preemptive browsers are being about the security of their users. Thank so goodness, yeah. I think you need to do nothing. And that wraps our podcast. We oh. will pick this up <laughs> next week. I see the clock on the wall says 4 p.m. Pacific time, which means that uh, the witching hour has arrived. And we've given our listeners an hour and 57 minutes, which gives, which I'm told is several commutes worth for most of them. So that ought to tide them over till next week. I don't know. This family's got to go back to Sonora. Can we do three or four more hours? It'd just really be, really be helpful right. for them. I'll just go make some more coffee. <laughs> Steve's at GRC.com, the Gibson Research Corporation. 
Uh, that's where you'll find all the stuff he does. Of course, Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility, but also the perfect paper password squirrel, password haystacks, all the free stuff he got, does shields up. People still use that, right? It's still really great no, way. No, it's cranking to away. I'm, I'm a, we're approaching 100 million users. That is amazing. That is amazing. He uh, also puts a podcast there, so you can get uh, uh, audio 16 kilobit if you want and 64 kilobit as well. Uh, and full transcriptions. Elaine Ferris writes those nice transcriptions for us. Uh, that's all at grc.com. We also have the show uh, audio and video as well at twit.tv slash sn. Uh, it's also on YouTube, youtube.com slash security now. It's also on every podcast application in the world. And even now on Apple TV, there are four Apple TV apps for Twit. And all of them have security now. So there's lots of ways to watch. If you want to watch live... We're here about 1.30 in the afternoon every Tuesday. That's 4.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC. So you can watch live or you can do like this good-looking family has done and just pop in and we'll entertain you. I think we put the six-year-old to sleep, but the rest of them have been wide-eyed for the whole thing. Yeah, they're going to sleep from now on. <laughs> uh, just email tickets at twit.tv. We'll make sure there's uh, room for you. Uh, let's see. I guess that uh, wraps up. Have a great Thanksgiving. You're going to stay home? I'm going to stay here. I, I go out. We have a great restaurant. We go to a group of my friends Fun. and some local neighbors get together, and we all go down, and then I'll be up for Christmas, but uh, staying down here. Good. Well, have a great and Thanksgiving. And I, I should mention, I referred briefly about some work on Squirrel. Uh, in the last week, we hammered out a local application authentication solution which we are not going to implement just for the sake of time. It's time to ship this puppy. Uh, but uh, I wanted to go through the, the, the logic of it and nail it down so that, uh, so that it was known that it could do that. So it can, it can be used to authenticate not only to remote servers, but local applications will be able to use it with, ab with absolute full security. So, for example, Great. you could use Squirrel to log into LastPass. Uh, you know, as an example, instead of using a username and password, even though it's a local app. So we figured out how to do that with a tiny little extension of the protocol, which is, it turned out very elegantly. Uh, but we're, we're going to save that for version 1.1 or whatever and get Squirrel finished. Yay. Looking forward to seeing it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Leo. Security.